Okay, well, let's get to a few uh, like introductions here. So in case anyone doesn't know Matt, but of course everyone does who's watching, but for later on, in case anyone doesn't know Matt, he has a channel called The Grass Factor, and you kind of tackle some of the uh, more technical things of lawn care and just have a lot of fun on there. And you do your live stream, so let's not forget about that. Yeah, I, I, I defaulted to the live stream because I'm in this transition period in my career right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's right now what I'm doing. But very soon, as I build out the studio in my house, there will be much more of the educational piece too. And, and I like to talk about the science. Yes. I'm really into the science of lawn care, the chemistry of lawn care. And maybe getting back a few whiteboard episodes, maybe? There. Yes. Yes. Yes, yep. you heard it here first. <laughs> the whiteboard is coming. So in case any of you were not here at the beginning, we were talking about Matt seeing this amount of snow for the first time today, which was interesting. This is the most snow that he's ever had. And for Iowa, I wouldn't call this a lot, but for a Southern person, I guess that is a lot. It's crippling. And it, how about the cold? What did you think of the cold? It's painful. <laughs> It's about, uh, the wind chill is around 10, maybe. Not bad. You know, I'm, is, uh, is this further north than Chicago? Um, just barely. Just barely? Yeah. Chicago is as far north as I've been, so I have now exceeded that. Yeah. Well, there you go. Next time you can come to my home state in Minnesota, and then you can, actually, you should go to Grand Forks where uh, Gravy is in the Discord. Yes, and then you can experience. Yes, your your quasi doppelganger. Yes. <laughs> Although I'd like to for him to explain to me how he's a Bears fan if he's from Minnesota, but that's another story. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not even going to go down that road. So, thank you so much for joining me and traveling all the way here. It was uh, something that I wasn't sure how many people were going to do, but Connor already made it here. You made it here. That's awesome. So I appreciate it very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm yeah. glad to be here. Have you? So this is the first time that you've ever been to Iowa, correct? Correct. And you didn't get to see a whole lot today because obviously it's just snowy, but we were talking in the car a little bit about some of the cultural things that are different between the South and here. And it's, it's kind of interesting that way, I guess I would say. Yeah. Oddly, I have a feeling though, that there's going to be a lot more in common between this Midwest region and the South. Mm -hmm. um, it may not be so... One one thing about the South, it, it's kind of the the old culture. You know, you you fit in line, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you you kind of abandon that idea of individuality. You know, mm -hmm. you, you you look like everybody else, you, you talk like everybody else, and you know, if 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 there's bad things that are happening in your life, you kind of keep it a secret, right? Yep. You know, and uh, it's always bless your heart. Yeah, you know, and uh, don't don't air the dirty laundry kind of thing, but you gossip about it with everybody, right? So I I don't know how that parlays here um you know it's kind of similar but i guess i would say because i grew up in a really small town like that's just kind of the, a small town culture thing i'm mm -hmm. not sure about bigger you know but even in a bigger place like this i think most people their neighborhood just kind of becomes their little small town if that makes any sense sure so i would say it's probably pretty similar yeah and, and then really the only thing that's different is the accent mm -hmm. um the sports you're fans of yep and all the freaking snow on the ground. <laughs> the accent thing is very funny to me because I don't really think that I have an accent, but every once in a while I catch the Minnesota thing coming out. But my parents and like my, some of my, my brother has a pretty thick accent, uh -huh. like the Minnesota, like really long O type thing, but Minnesota. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. That thing for sure. Yeah. I don't, I don't hear one from you. Yeah. And I, I know I definitely have one. Yes, I try to, I try to keep it in check. And a lot of times I can't hear it either. So, uh, especially like when I'm doing the live stream, I try and keep it nice and proper when I talk. But you know, I'll, I'll roll an R out uh -huh. there. So, where did you grow up? Then was it in Tennessee or? Yeah, really. I'm I'm from Memphis. You know, I I went to school my entire life in Memphis. Um, uh, originally I, I, I lived for a period of time in Mississippi and, uh, small area there, Eudora walls. That's kind of where my mom's side of the family originates. And then 
we moved to Memphis and that's where I went to school and did all my adolescent years. Okay. And so then where did you go to college at? Uh, went to University of Tennessee. Okay. And then after that, went back to Memphis and then kind of went a woo, 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 around the South. Okay. So um, when I was doing the corporate lawn care world, uh, you know, would go do training in Little Rock and then go to Huntsville and then go to Memphis. And then uh, we actually launched a branch in Augusta, Georgia. Uh, and then we were going to go to uh, Greenville, South Carolina, when we made the decision to start the own spray mm -hmm. business okay. and then went back to Knoxville. Okay. So you really have been kind of all over the South then pretty much just traveling around. Yeah. And you kind of know all the different areas, which is kind of nice too. It is. Yep. It is. You have a little familiarity with it. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Yeah. So as a kid, were you kind of into this whole outdoor thing at that point or what, what kind of hobbies did you have when you were kind of hanging out as a kid? Um, I was, I was a little weird. So when, when I was really young, I was super sensitive. I was sick all the time and it was, I was always battling either, you know, tonsillitis or pneumonia up until like maybe second or third grade. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I became an athlete. And I just loved sports. And it was sports, 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 bicycle, 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 bicycle. Mm -hmm. So that was, yeah, I, I stayed outside nonstop. It's kind of an interesting thing for me because I was kind of like that as a kid. Like I, I had asthma, like I got diagnosed when I was around five or so. Mm -hmm. But I had really bad allergies and I was just like pretty much allergic to everything outside. So mm -hmm. it was like stay inside as much as I could. and eventually it kind of just grew out of it luckily but yeah it's uh it's not very much fun when you're sick all the time when you're a kid no but at the same time like i don't know i i just wasn't super personal as a kid i mean i was so scared i was the scaredest kid that maybe has ever lived oh that's exactly how i was was it i mean i was <laughs> nervous about everything and I, you know i think i told you before like me now being super outgoing and boisterous is it's kind of like a coping mechanism for me mm -hmm. it's it's just it's so, how I combat my fear. Yeah. Loud. That's interesting. I see those are the things that like Connor was saying in our little talk too, was that, you know, he's not really that much of a social person and I would never gather that, but I do understand the, the kind of coping thing. Like sometimes I would say I'm kind of a pretend extrovert, <laughs> like every once in a while, most of the time I'm not like, I'm just like fine being by myself at home and doesn't bother me, but then I, I can pretend to be one every once in a while. It's kind of, yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty extroverted. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm outgoing. I can talk to anybody, you know, I, I'll meet three rows of people around me while I'm on the airplane here, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of a weird thing. I do it just to combat the anxiety that goes along with air travel and having to give up the, the space. Yep. So, yeah, you know, I, I kind of feed into it because I enjoy it. But at the same time, it's like, a, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to make the best of this situation. And you right. Know. Yeah, it was naturally just that way for me. Like, I remember I was like five years old and I was playing T-ball or something. And we had a coach that kind of like, even if it was little kids, he yelled a lot. Uh -huh. And I was just like this, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm like 30 pounds, like, you know, <laughs> and I was just terrified and I remember the one day that he's just like yelling at everyone. My grandma was like, if you want to go home, you can go home. And I was like, I'm going home. She just took me home. So yeah, <laughs> it was, it was interesting. Those, those days. I definitely was, was very similar. So did you continue being an athlete then all the way up till through high school and everything? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Through high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, played basketball and golf. A lot of people ask if I played football. I didn't. That's what I would have assumed. Yeah. yeah. I was not big until after high school okay. um it, i'll i'll give you an example when i was in eighth grade i was six foot tall but 145 pounds so pretty yeah pretty skinny and then when i graduated high school i was six foot four 200 pounds the year before i was 170 pounds so i mean it just you know yep. it kind of kind of jumped there at the end okay so 
did you so you said you played golf then yeah. you're still good at golf no uh i got i got married and uh i forgot what golf was <laughs> i used to be good at golf when i was uh like a teenager our our little golf course in my hometown had like i think you could buy a full year membership as a kid for like 90 dollars or something mm -hmm. for the entire year go as much as you want so i would go like right away in the morning sometimes in the afternoon and i got to be fairly good because you just practice that much you get decent mm -hmm. but i haven't played golf in probably two years now so i'm not not very good anymore yeah i don't want to tell you the last time i played was but it, it was <laughs> it was kind of nice my my mom would drop me off at the golf course and then she would go to work and then pick me up on the way home mm -hmm. and so i would just spend the entire day out there just blasting golf balls so that kind of lead into anything about your interest in kind of turf and stuff like that or oh, did, of or, course yeah of course so you know, I, I went to college with these dreams and aspirations of being an engineer. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized really quickly, like, that is not what I wanted to do. And as kind of a backup plan, I was, I loved golf. And um, I began to think more and more, like, I knew I was not artsy enough. I didn't have the, the, the level of strategy to be able to do something like design. Mm -hmm. um, so I figured, you know, what if, what if you like get into the actual just management of the turf side of it? Right. And, uh, and I did. And then it sent me down the wormhole of chemistry and chemistry is always what I really liked. I always really liked algebraic based math and chemistry. Mm -hmm. And it just scratched that itch every which way imaginable. Right. And uh, so I, 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 I went hard at it, really hard. So is that what what did you study then at UT? Yeah, turf grass. Turf grass. Yeah. Okay. And that's from what I've heard you saying or talking about it before. That's a pretty good program. Uh, University of Tennessee mm -hmm. is up there. The SEC is really doing a good job on turf. Um, Purdue, uh, also in the Northeast, Ohio State, have, mm -hmm. have great turf programs. Uh, but Mississippi State... Um, University of Tennessee is kind of leading the the front on herbicide resistance right now. So a lot of interesting research coming out about that. Um, you know, of course, you know UGA and Tifton, Georgia, they're doing a lot of the genetic research and mm -hmm. you know using radioactive cobalt to, to you know develop new new types of turf grass species and right. um, cultivars. Yep. So it's it's pretty neat. So what? kind of led you down the path then of getting into your own company and kind of doing that whole thing um to be perfectly honest it was it was a giant mistake i did not know what i was doing mm -hmm. um and i figured that i have i'm a great technician i can do this i have seen the mechanics of the business side of this this is what i need to be doing and I guess that that was a little bit of the motivator. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we were moving a lot and, I, you know, I just, I didn't fit real well in the corporate culture. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you talk about the discrepancies between, uh, you know, we'll, we'll say like the North and the South in this instance. Uh, one of the things I always did was I, I love to write notes to my customers and I would always start them. Hey y'all, howdy ma'am, howdy sir. Something like that. That mm -hmm. was always the start. Right. And I had, I had a boss that was from Michigan and he reamed me to no end. I mean, would not let it go for, for weeks. Really? Yeah. And it was just like, that's unprofessional and blah, blah, blah. And I always had great compliments on my notes and, it was then I was like, you know what? I know I've had great compliments. This is what I'm going to do. I'm forget it. I'm going to go start my own business out of out of frustration, right? And I, I did, and it was. I wish I would have had more of a business understanding. Mm -hmm. I was I was a horrible business person, and so from the get go, I had to learn how to be a business person, and it needed to be the other way around. Mm -hmm. I think that's a a lot of business like small businesses like that is people have a passion for something mm -hmm. and they just kind of think, Oh, I'll just do that. And eventually I'll figure out the rest of it. But the problem with that is that 
all during that time, you have to have that other stuff figured out or it's not going to work very well. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, first year was, I mean, it was, it was a nightmare. Year number two was half the year was a nightmare. And then year number three was really starting to feel, feel good. Yep. So what kind of challenges besides that business stuff, like what kind of challenges were you running into with your own business there? Like, was there any specific things that you kind of learned along the way or, you know, moments that you remember that were specifically challenging with it? Um, so, you know, I kind of grouped having your own spray business, you, you know, you had to, you had to decide what kind of business you wanted to be. And I kind of grouped them into, into three categories. You had number one, where you were going to be a, a solo operator and you were only going to take on the highest event customers. And that way you don't have to take on a lot of them. It'd still be very demanding. It'd still mm -hmm. be very challenging. Um, but you know, you rely on me, myself and I, and, uh, and that's your structure. Then there's the, the second group where, uh, you, you, you may kind of, of take on, uh, some, some lower end properties, but it helps kind of pad the pockets right. and, you know, maybe you're struggling to get those high end properties or you've made some mistakes on some high end properties and you, you start losing them. And so. Like, well, I'm going to take these easier accounts to pick them up and, and balance the money. So maybe, maybe then you bring on a second guy to take the phone call load off of you. And I kind of call that like the halfback, right? Right. And then there's the one where everybody dreams of being a millionaire, right? So uh, there's the guy that, you know, has six trucks. And, but at, at that point, as a business owner, you have to, you have to let go of the emotional aspect of maintaining the properties. Mm -hmm. And that's because, hard to do for someone that's that passionate about it. Correct. Yeah. And so I always tried to be a blend of the one and two and three. And so first it happened, I realized I was like, okay, there's three ways to approach this. And then I realized that, you know, I'm doing things for this yard purely out of budget that I'm not doing for this yard mm -hmm. where budget isn't the issue. So yep. I, I need to, to you know, mold it all into one and less than one or greater than the other. And then I tried to put a barrier, you know, that, so th then kind of the final step was hiring somebody to, to put that filter before it gets to you. Right. And it, it still, it was just difficult. Mm -hmm. At, every step of the way it was difficult. So, and I always thought with those businesses, especially with like turf and stuff like that, it's hard to, you know, I was watching one of your videos about the renovation that you were doing. I think it was one of the first times that you were trying like not top dressing and you were just using like RGS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just watching that and it was kind of like, you know, there were some comments like, well, you got to make sure the customer understands like they've got to irrigate, they've got to, there's so many things that the customer still has to kind of be in charge of. And it's hard, I would think in those businesses when you can't control what they're doing, like mowing unless they're going to mow things properly or you have someone do it that you can trust, then it's kind of on you what the yard looks like. But yet there's a piece of that that they're doing too that's you have no control over. So it's interesting. I would always tell people that if you want to hire me to take care of your yard, you're going to work harder in your yard than you've ever had to before in your life. Mm-hmm. And that's just the reality of the situation. Yeah. If you want to mow it once a week and just be done with it and not think about it, I am not the provider for you. Right. Because I'm going to be in your face. I'm going to be in your ear. I'm going to complain to you. I'm going to tell you you're doing a terrible job. And I'm going to give you a list of 10 things to do every time I see your yard. Yep. And some people are into it. Some people aren't. Right. So did you ever think about going into um, like the golf side of things? Like, turf at a golf course or sports turf, like professional, something like that. Yeah. That's, that's where I got started. Okay. Uh, 2008 when the economy crashed money left sports turf really quickly, especially golf. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, golf almost died there basically for an instance. And then the whole tiger woods thing happened and yep. it's sl slowly kind of trying to recover, but the money that was in golf is no longer there. And so, you know, I was trying to get a job and you know, the best job I could get was $8 an hour for, you know, 700 hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And that would be like the guarantee. We're going to guarantee you 700 hours and 
eight bucks an hour. Yeah. And I'm like, what am I, what? It was, it's really crazy to me how low some of those people get paid or the, like the amount of money. Like I know the guy that takes care of the entire field at Iowa State, like the football field, all of the stuff around there, which is a lot of other fields that he has. He's in charge of all this. And I think his salary was like maybe 60. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, man, that's like, <laughs> that's a lot of commitment and, th and things you're in charge of for a very small amount of money for what they're doing work-wise. I would say that's about average. Yeah. It is, I, I, will, I will tell you this, it is not a glamorous lifestyle. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually was looking at getting a job a couple of years ago. Um, so the AAA team here is the Iowa Cubs or Chicago Cubs minor league, like highest level minor uh, league. And they have like a little turf thing where they go out and do renovations for sports fields, like high schools, things that those schools can't really take care of, but that they have the equipment to do. So there was a job open for it and I actually applied and I kind of called them and stuff and they're like, yeah, the pay is like, um, it's like 30,000 and you work like 14 hours a day, pretty much eight months straight. And then you get the winter off and I'm like, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, that's not a, it's not a whole lot there. So. It's totally a feast or famine type industry too, because, you know, winter sets in and, you know, I was fortunate in the Memphis area, you know, it was, it was two weeks off and everywhere yeah. really in the South, you get two weeks off. Yeah. So that was weird today when I knew you were coming here and I was like, okay, Matt's in Atlanta. Well, I'm going to see what the weather's like. So I just said to Alexa, like, what, what's the weather? And she's like, oh, it's 65. And I was like, <laughs> looking out here because <laughs> we don't really remember that that exists. Like uh, I've always lived in the Midwest, so I don't really ever think of it being warm in January, no matter what. I'm yeah. just like, oh, it's never going to be warm. So it's interesting. It hit 89 degrees in mid-February last year in wow. Knoxville. Wow. It was weird. So if you guys have some questions and you're watching here, if you want to ask a question for Matt, just tag me if you would. So just at Ryan or Lawn Care, and then that way it'll highlight and I can come back and see what you guys have questions about. I see Jake the Lawn Kid all the way from over here. Yep, Jake's here. Future former lawn noob. I got to meet him when I was in Florida. Yep. Uh, he has a question. Matt, did you ever go back and get a business degree? Uh, no. No. Uh, because it, by the time I started the business, I was so invested in it that there was no way I would have time. Mm -hmm. Um, if you ask my wife, she would tell you I'm one obsessive compulsive and two, a workaholic. I don't stop. So it's from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to bed, yep. I'm either learning or I'm doing the, the physical part of my job. Mm -hmm. So there was just no time, but I would love to maybe one day if I could ever just stop working. Yep. Uh, Matt, did you bring any super juice with you? <laughs> <laughs> We're on super juice already. Green Doc is here. What's up, my man Ray over in Hawaii? I will say this too, and this is this is seriously it. You know, you beginning to learn about turf and and especially from an academic point of view to a real world point of view. I was so overwhelmed with the real world. Mm -hmm. Like you start thinking about, uh, you, you know, plant physiology is going to be a lot of what you learn in school. And then you step into the real world and all of a sudden it's like, okay, it's this time of year and I'm dealing with a bunch of broadleaf weeds. And uh, the, the only herbicide I really know is, uh, you know, two, four D and, and you go and you start trying to buy two four D, and you're like, oh man! And they're like, what kind of two four D do you want? You're like, I, I, there's more than one two four D. Yeah. And it really early, like 2008 2009, I found Green Doc on the internet, and I stalked him for years. I mean, for <laughs> for ten years, I have stalked him, and I single handedly credit learning more about turf grass from him any other thing I've ever done. And that's what I've just, since I've started, I talked to you about this the other day, but there's so many topics in that discord thing that I'm learning so much about so many different things. But yeah, <laughs> there's some people in there that I have went to and I'm like, please teach me some things because I need to know 
what to actually say. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not a professional, so I'm just trying to learn along the way here and make sure that I can understand things. So in that way, I was kind of like looking at a lot of the book ways of doing things. Uh -huh. But then I don't have necessarily the real world experience other than what I'm seeing in my own yard here, mm -hmm. which is experience, but I can't necessarily relate it to a bunch of other places mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's so many different variables. Yeah. You know, um, let's see if there's another question. Hey guys, how does molasses slash dethatch help break down the dead grass and thatch layers? Who who asked that? Koji is that his name? Yep. Okay, so Koji, it's kind of an old farmer's trick that you could take uh, molasses and uh, a little bit of beer and throw it into a tank and on a hot day go and spray it. Uh, super old farm trick. Easy way to get calcium down, and depending on your molasses source, you get some sulfur down. So. Basically, it works the exact same way. Um, you know, it's got simple sugars. It's got a little bit of bacteria and a little bit of food for the bacteria from the simple sugars and a little bit of nitrogen in it. So uh, that's exactly how it works. Um, and one of the big things in, uh, I, at least, you know, in Kentucky, where we have the plant, watching, watching those corn farmers, as they're harvesting, they have a spray truck behind it that's spraying now, you know, that they're doing no-till and stuff, mm -hmm. immediately spraying it with uh, a digester, which is molasses, usually humic acid, kelp, and that's a little bit of nitrogen. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's it's harvest, and I mean, you know, it's, it's one row over. This is a good question. Um, it says... How about some tips for new construction homes where the soil is most likely garbage? We see this a lot around here because mm -hmm. they take all of our nice Iowa soil and remove it and go sell it somewhere. And they yep. leave you with just pretty much the clay that's underneath. Um, first thing first, test it. You got to test, test mm -hmm. it. Establish some sort of baseline. Because on those new construction sites, I would love to give you a one-size-fits-all approach, but... I have gone into a neighborhood and next door to next door, even though they both have structural fill as the basis for the yard. I've seen one where the pH was a 4.8 and next door it was an 8.4. Wow. That's yeah. And it's just where they took the structural fill to, to, to build that out. And it may look like they took it from right there. You know, they'd scraped out a, a hillside and then use that to, to level it out, but it'll be completely different because they, it's actually a truck that they had left over from another job site that they brought over there to do it. So always, first and foremost, start with the soil test. Usually that will give you an indicator of where you're deficient, at least in something. Mm -hmm. And then you can work on correcting that deficiency. But you have to think, because that is new construction and the amount it has been disturbed, there is no carbon left in that soil. There's yeah. nothing. So it usually, it usually doesn't uh, perk water very well. Uh, same thing. Nutrients are, are not going to perk very well. Roots are going to face a lot of resistance as they develop because of how ta uh, compact it is. And right. So focus on a carbon aspect. Feed it very balanced, especially according to a soil test. And uh, That's probably a good segue into carbon. You know a little bit about that. I've, I've worked a little bit with it. So can you talk a little bit about kind of the story behind the fertilizer that you're working on that is coming out and kind of uh, in layman's terms for, I've been seeing a lot of things recently about people thinking that it's kind of like a malorganite product. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of wanted to give you a floor here to kind of explain what it is and, and uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. So it's, it's really funny. Many, this is, this is three, three years ago. Um, my business partner, his name is John Borden. Um, John Borden was working at the farmer's market in market square in Knoxville. And my wife was pregnant at the time we would go walk it. And I saw this guy hustling a jar of this black material that was being advertised as like a, a, a soil amendment. So I approach him and I, I said, uh, you know, Hey, what's this? And he's like, Oh, it's biochar. And I was like, okay, what's biochar. And he gave me a pamphlet and he said, you know, listen, come down to our lab and I, I want to show you some things. I'm going to show you some things we're working on. I want to let you see what it looks like under a microscope. I'm going to do some experiments. And 
it just just so you can see what exactly it does. So I did. I, I went down and, you know, the company he worked for, it was crazy. You know, they had over 100 employees. There's lots of really young guys like you and I walking around. And, you know, they're all engineer types and stuff and chemists everywhere. And I was super overwhelmed and impressed at the same time, right? Uh-huh. I'm like, wow, this is so cool. So he he started showing me just, you know, biochar in and of itself. It basically just looks like a sponge when you look at it under a microscope. Very honeycomb-like shape. And because it, it's carbon, it does it's a really good conductor of electricity. It's one of the best conductors of electricity, depending on the purity. And it, because of that, it can bond to things that have a, have a charge really easily, right? Mm-hmm. So... I didn't really understand it then at the time. I just wanted to to play with it. So he had started some trials with some trees and um, we started recording data on the trees. We almost killed the trees because we didn't know what to do with the biochar and we were using way too much and it was sucking everything out of the soil and Mm -hmm. the, the trees were just sick and decrepit and starving and yellow. And we were like, uh Oh, (laughs) (laughs) So I got the great idea that it, as I began to research a little bit more, um, I, I had f- I'd come across a, a study that showed that it actually slowed the drainage in sand. So you apply the carbon and the increased porosity uh, would actually slow the infiltration of water through sand. So it would help mitigate things like localized dry spot. Mm-hmm. So I said, you know, I've got an athletic field I maintain that's sand-based. That's what I was going to get to is I hope you tell the story about when you first put this all out on the field. Yep. <laughs> so we we started top dressing it a- across the field and it turned the entire field black. And it looked like I had gone out there with a bag of charcoal, crushed it up into a powder and just spread tons of it mm-hmm. out there. Coach walks up to me (laughs) really early into it, and he was like, Matt, are you sure this is going to be okay? You you sure about this, Matt? This is is a really black, Matt. You sure about this? (laughs) I'm like, Coach, don't worry about it. We're going to be fine. He's like, I'm trusting you, Matt, but I'm telling you right now. All right, right, I'm going to trust you, but that's that's really black. And we get halfway through it, and he's really stomping out there. Matt, are you sure this is going to be – I'm not sure, Matt. And so we finish it, and I (laughs) – the athletic director comes out and he's like, this is, this has got to be fixed. Like we got to do something about this. This is going to ruin uniforms. You got to do something. And they are hot. They were really hot. I had to get out of there. I'm freaking out. Mm -hmm. So I leave, I tell him, I said, listen, mow it, water it, mow it, water it. I mean, you you can't get water on it fast enough and and you got to get it mowed. And so they mow it. And of course they hit like some sort of, I don't know. I, apparently there was a screwdriver in the hopper when we were doing it and he <laughs> oh, hit it with a reel and he blew out the reel on oh, it. Oh man! I mean, just the whole thing was a disaster. And uh, he called me and he said, uh, you, you got to get back down here right now. And I was like, Oh my God, no. And I've really thought about just hanging up and never answering the phone again. And I was like, no, I'm just going to go take my whip. Disappearing, moving. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I I pull back up and I can see, you know, khakis, white button up shirts and ties all standing at the 50 yard line. And I'm just like, oh, man, this is not good. I get out. I walk up. Coach hops off the mower and he drops his sunglasses and he smiles. And all you can see are his teeth (laughs) and his eyeballs. And the rest of his face is as black as as coal. And I can't help but laugh. And he's like. Matt, damn it, I think it's going to be all right. <laughs> As I, I looked at the grass, and you, you can't see it anymore, and I ran, and I slid across it, and I went out and I pointed at my shirt, and we are all high-fiving and stuff. And so that was our first experiment using biochar. And then you know, John, the company he worked for at the time, he monitored the results. And uh, one of the things they paid attention to was like beneficial bacteria and fungi counts, watching how that, that peaked and then waned. Um, and one of the things we noticed is that we were actually getting sustained performance from our inputs, our MP and K, uh, for longer mm-hmm. with just the same amounts. So 
I told John, because it required a tractor to spread it and a, a truck to carry it, I said, if you could ever get this into a prill, a fertilizer prill, we got a product we can work with. Fast forward three years later, two years later, and he calls me and he's like, hey, man, you want to go get some beers? I'm like, yeah. He's like, all right, come on. We're going over the, the field house social. And uh, he pulls out out of his pocket like some sort of drug dealer. He's like, hey, man, what do you think of this? <laughs> and it's got like these very rudimentary type fertilizer prills. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's it right there. Mm -hmm. So he's he's got all these analyses and stuff we're looking at and we're getting really excited. Right. And he's like, so, you know, how much, how much, how much do you think we can move? And I was like, I have no idea. I start calling people like, Hey, would you be interested in this product? Would you be interested? In, would you be in this interested in this product? And so it, it came out to, to a number and I called John and I said, uh, you know, this, this is the number I think, you know, about, but we can move. And he was like, we need to go get another beer. And so, we go the next time and he is drinking really heavily <laughs> and he's like, are you sure? Like, are you sure? And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation I've had with people and he's sweating and he's panicking and he's like, all right, let's, let's start a business. And so we did, we went and found money and we started building our plant in Kentucky. And that's what you're working on right now then basically trying to get everything up and going. Yeah. So we actually, we, we ran our first batch of material last week. Okay. Um, like, I, like I told you, you know, we're working for uh, some, um, some high end organic farmers in Kentucky right now to mm -hmm. dial in our machines. Um, it's not a malorganite. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you really simply just a list of the ingredients. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we use biochar. I'll give you a real firm basis. So we use biochar, um, ammonium sulfate and, and, uh, chicken litter and RGS. Basically it's just like a giant vehicle conduit. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to have the chicken litter in there to make it all come and hold together. Right. And, uh, and of course I'm a big fan of the RGS product. So I, I wanted a way to get that into a granular form. So, that's that's the basis of it. Mm -hmm. And then then from there, we just wanted to make it cute. So we started playing with higher rates of iron. Um, from what we learned is that the more iron we put into it, the harder it would get. So that would increase our crush strength and you know long term life in a bag. And mm -hmm. said, okay, that that's good. And then, you know, we wanted to broaden the range of actual nutrients that were applied. And so then, you know, we added a little bit of micronutrients and then we wanted to add a little bit of potash to it. And uh, so right. that's how it all came together. So there are definitely things in there that are going to be, you know, it's soil based because of things like that, like the char and then the RGS and stuff like that. But as far as being anything like malorganite, it's not really there's nothing biosolid in there or anything like that. So it's not really that kind of product. No, there's, there's no, there's no human waste. It, it is all recycled material. So, you know, the char is from the renewable energy sector. Of course, chicken litter comes from chicken farming. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no, it's not a pure, it's not an organic product. It's right. a, uh, it, it's just different. So when are you looking at having, any kind of uh, supply of it ready for people? Uh, sh trucks are going to start shipping February 1st. Okay. And uh, we're going to have, it's going to happen really quickly. So we produce two tractor trailer loads a day. Um, so as far as what we have on the books right now is, you know, in, in, in a week's time frame, you know, we're, yeah, we're going to the masses. That was one of the questions that I put out a little thing on Instagram. That's uh when you were coming here and I was like, Hey, if you have questions for Matt and they were like, when is Pete getting his first truckload of carbon X? That was one of the questions. <laughs> was that from Pete? No, I don't think so, but <laughs> he might want to know too, actually. <laughs> yeah, actually Pete and I, we, we had a long conversation yesterday about it. Okay. So that kind of clears things up and it gives me a little bit more information too, because I understood the basis of things, but I kind of wanted to get a little bit more information and, who's better than you actually sitting here, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it's not, it's not overly complicated what we're doing. It's just one of the big things is that we wanted to put as much into the prill as possible. 
Um, we wanted to eliminate waste. So it's a, it's a zero waste manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. Anything that doesn't meet our specifications gets recycled back into the process, which was, that was big for us. Um, you know, there's no, there's no wastewater. Um, everything we have on site stays on site and stays geared towards the benefit of the fertilizer. Yeah, that's good. So let's switch gears just a little bit to kind of the YouTube thing. And I wanted to get a little bit of your kind of thoughts on how that whole thing all started for you. Cause it's kind of an interesting story for most people that decide to be on camera and do that whole deal. So what was your kind of basis for starting it? It was, it was summer and it was really hot outside maybe in late spring, I don't know, high 80s, low 90s. I was treating a, I don't know, two, three, four acre yard. And I was broke, first year in business. And I had, I had started watching the YouTube lawn care thing and seeing, you know, seeing Alan and, you know, at the time it was geek to freak and, mm -hmm. I was like, I know way more than these guys do. <laughs> way more. I said, I'm going to start talking to the camera and I'm just going to upload it and see what happens. So I did. I started talking to the camera and just started putting it up. And I mean, I, I probably put out videos for a year. And I only had 400 subscribers. Mm -hmm. But my phone was ringing nonstop. And it was so bizarre to me. I mean, talking to my wife, I was like, you don't understand. I had six people call me today from around the United States to ask me questions about their yard. And it, I mean, it's, you know, I'm the same way I get obsessed. I mean, immediately I was sent into a wormhole of, of obsession mm -hmm. and it's just gone until now. Yep. Yeah. I think that as soon as you start to, the beginning is tough. And even right now, like, Every once in a while, just depending on the topic, whatever you post, like sometimes it doesn't get very, it doesn't get much push or something happens or whatever. And it's kind of like you need that little bit of interaction with people to kind of keep you going with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, once you have that and you see that there's people out there that want knowledge, they want to learn things, they all they really want is someone to help them. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, wow, all you know. I'll, I'll never forget the first time Pete called me. So this was this was prior to his YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he had a couple videos or something, you know. But you know, Pete called me and he's like, "Hey, this is Pete, <laughs> TCI Turk." <laughs> exactly the same, right? Yeah. And I mean, that first time we talked, I bet we talked for I don't know a good three hours, and I was like, "Pete, listen, we we got to keep talking." He's like. We, we keep talking. I got way too much work to do. We're going to have to talk again later. And, uh, you know, I mean, just immediately we were like, wow, we're the, we're the same breed of, of human. And then you meet someone else and you're like, oh my God, yep. we're different, but we're the same. And yep. then, it's, it's interesting. So when did you meet John Perry then? I met John, not this GIE, but the GIE before. That was the first time I met him face to face. Okay. I had met him that year, but uh, maybe like March. Okay. So two years, I guess I've known John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just wondered kind of how that kind of, I was assuming it was maybe from your business too, like how you maybe started using some of those products and things, but. You want to, you want to know? Yeah. Oh, it's funny. Okay. Tell me. Okay. Uh, I was using this fertilizer called Screaming Green. Mm -hmm. I've heard you mention it. Yeah. Uh, I had just bought $12,000 worth of Screaming Green. And John was talking about it was unnecessary for me to use that, that I could go about it differently and get the same result uh, probably for half the cost. So buyer's remorse immediately started to set in. Yeah. And so what do I start doing? I start doing like any monkey would do. And I, I start flaming him hard. I'm like, you're a liar. 
what 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 are you trying to sell me? <laughs> really? Oh man, yeah. hard. I was I was so all over John Perry. He was like, okay, listen, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a conference call. And this is so we have a private uh, Facebook group of just professional lawn care applicators. Mm-hmm. And he, he posed it to everybody in the entire group. Whoever wants to be on this conference call can be on this conference call. I'll answer any of your questions. And I get on there and I am going ham. I am all over him. And he kept his composure the entire time. He never called me an a hole. <laughs> he, he, he never told me to stop. He never told me to shut up. He entertained me and he kept going. I come from old school turf, you know, and you know, you either have organic programs, which are really unpredictable, or you have conventional programs. And then maybe you could play a little bit with the blend of the two. And that's what I was trying with the screaming green. And then he was big time. Like, you know, wait, that's way too complicated. I'm going to simple, simplify it down, but you got to run liquids. And so I start taking my knowledge of liquid fertilizers and professional turf, and then applying it to lawn care. And then I really started looking at, uh, digging really deep into the ingredients and in his products. And I was amazed not only at how simple it was, but the weird thing about John is that he's, he's really artsy fartsy. Yes. Even mm-hmm. when it comes to the way he mixes his fertilizers, it, there's a certain level of just art to it. And I, I started thinking about it. At first, I've questioned everything. I'm like, no, man, you're you're a liar. This is this is snake oil. You're not gonna do anything. And he's like, okay, just try it. Just try it. So I get it. I study the label. I look at the MSDS. I'm deep on the web looking at MSDSs. And I'm like, oh, I see what he's doing here. That ingredient makes sense. You know, like his his you know, UAN solutions and stuff, and the 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 in charge kick and the, the way he stabilizes the nitrogen without using like a biology blocker. I was like, you jerk. Like, <laughs> you this figured is, it this out. is great. <laughs> this is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love it. And then you're looking at prices and then like, man, this is cheap too for, for what you're getting. So then, you know, I, 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 I warned him though. I said, listen, I'm going to use your, pro- I'm going to buy your RGS. You're not going to send it to me. I said, I'm going to use it and I'm going to smear you all over YouTube. And he was like, Okay. Mm-hmm. And it the problem was is that it worked. So yeah. I couldn't smear him. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good story. Because uh, I just kind of wondered how that whole thing, you know, there's a lot of people that have had those similar thoughts when it kind of became like DIY this past year or, you know, once Alan started using it, things like that. But, I mean, I've just, once I talked to him too, like once you actually talk to him and you kind of, understand the background behind things and you're like oh yeah that all makes sense Mm -hmm. and so i'm kind of looking at some different things again not that i have like some kind of major educational background on this but just what i've done in my yard for years now that has worked but i've always been doing a lot of nitrogen Mm -hmm. especially with bluegrass like just been especially in the fall just nitrogen nitrogen so i'm just kind of thinking now about what i might do a little bit differently or maybe a little bit less. Type oh, I've of thing. got some great ideas for you. So we'll talk about I've that. I've got some great <laughs> ideas. Let's, you think we should get some more questions here? Yeah. Hey man, I'm here for the ride. Oh, uh, what do we got? Connor's here. Ooh, Connor. I see real old dad. Hey yep. Connor. Hey, uh, dad. This was from hey, before I highlighted from real old dad. He said, which shed is better his or the one here? You haven't, looked in mine yet but you just saw the outside yeah i haven't looked in it i will say this mike Mm -hmm. um the one he has here is bigger than yours so yeah it is pretty big you know what we say in the south bigger is (laughs) better oh did you see uh ben in australia's video from last night when he got the flamingo you know when he shot that flamingo and the liquid came out I was so stunned. <laughs> what was that? I asked him last night. I was like, how did you do that end part? And he's like, I shot a gun and we shot a flamingo. I was like, no, I want to know, like, how did you film it? Because it looked like, a, I mean, it was awesome. And then I had the same question that some people did today in the Discord. They were like, I thought there weren't any guns in Australia. And he was like, no, if you have a, if you have a permit, you're fine. And I was like, oh, okay. 
Why was there liquid in the flamingo? I don't know. Don't dodge that question. I need to know. <laughs> there, he's here. Ben, why is there water in the flamingo? He just said it's just water, man. But that's we'll, not good enough. We will. That is. We not will wait good for enough. his response. Uh, hey, I see silver symbol. Yep, I he's here. Guy. Hey guys, great to see you on here. Um, uh, let's see. You can't have any. Uh, let's see. Hey, Matt. Which factors in more to Bermuda dormancy, daylight hours or soil temperature? Uh, dormancy is purely. It's, I mean, it's going to be both. Okay, so, um, but you're not going to enter f- like dormancy until you hit that frost. So there's actually three aspects of it. There's going to be soil temperature, which will suspend the top growth. There's going to be a light aspect, well, which will also slow the top growth. And then there's going to be a frost, which actually causes the quote unquote damage of it going dormant. Mm-hmm. Jake says the silverback says hello. Tell silverback I said hello. Ben didn't answer your question yet. Who? Ben, he didn't answer your question. Uh, ben, I need to know. This is freaking me out. Did you put water in that or did it come with water in it from the United States? Someone said Australian water was in it, a.k.a. Foster's beer. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is Foster's? That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Foster's, Australian for beer. So outside of this whole lawn thing, we were talking a little bit about you setting up a studio and. What do you think about uh, starting a little podcast of your own? Um, I, I probably wouldn't do it. Like maybe you just take your talks from your whiteboard and make it into a uh, little podcast. I, I probably, yeah, I could do something like that. But I, I even notice, like myself, do you, are you a YouTube premium user? No. Okay. I'm not. Um, I am. And so... I end up listening to more videos than I do watching them anyway. Okay. So I'll play it and then just turn the screen off and put it in my pocket. I probably should be because that is one thing that is nice about it. Mm -hmm. When you just, you want to listen to something and you don't have to sit it there and have it playing the whole time with the screen on. That's the only reason I have it. Yeah. But I was just thinking that when I was watching some of those talks, I was like, "Mm, it'd be, since you have your mic set up and everything, it it would be kind of nice if you just recorded it and had that as a podcast. What what kind of microphones are these? Uh, this is a Shure 80, Beta 87, and that one, I can't remember because I got it for free somewhere, and I don't remember what it is. It's a, it's not a Sennheiser. Uh, I don't it's, remember. It's a TGX 20. It's something German, I think. Of course. This is great. <laughs> Y'all can't sell on camera right now, but... <laughs> Um, this is awesome. I mean, this is so professional. I mean, he's got like mixing stations over here. There's like, I don't know, 300 knobs on that board. (laughs) And then there's like another 15 over here and we've got PCs recording and he's got multiple monitors on the, on the thing here. And he's got lighting and he's got a giant UFO that's landing in the middle of it right here. Yeah. And I, I'm not going to show you that, but I'll take a picture and I'll I'll throw it up on Instagram because there's a, there's a UFO right here. It's major overkill is kind of what I call it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, that's like one thing third. about me too is I once I do something, it has to be like I can't just start out and be like, oh well, let's just sit in front of my phone and record. No, it's got to be all out. Yep, that's, that's how I am. No, I'm I'm the same way too. Yeah. So you're also kind of I, the only thing else I wanted to kind of talk about was uh, being you're kind of a music guy like you like different types of music. I love music. Yeah. So what's something you're listening to right now? Um, there's a couple things I'm listening to right now. Uh, American Aquarium. Okay, I've heard of it. I don't know if I know too much. And it's kind of of a, a alt country is is a little bit my thing. Mm-hmm. Um. So I'm, I've been listening to their latest album. What's up, Gravy Lookout? I know, I know you have been too. He <laughs> bought it on vinyl. Um, I always default on a Saturday night to Lucero. Okay, Lucero is is my 
thing. I proposed to my wife at a Lucero concert. Okay. A big giant white dude proposed to a tiny Japanese girl at a Lucero concert. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I would have. I'm sure a lot of people were interested in seeing that. Oh gosh, I don't know what was going through my head. This is the most least romantic thing in the entire world. <laughs> um, and then uh, Sturgill Simpson. I'm yep. a really big fan of Sturgill Simpson. I like. Uh, I really like Jason Isbell. Yeah, one of my favorites. I need to. I, can I ask you about some music? Yes. How much of your music dives into the country sphere as far as what you listen to? A lot now. So uh-huh. I grew up. My dad was like all pretty much classic rock. So okay. I actually I remember when I was a kid, my first concert was Sticks. Yeah, which is why I know Sticks so well. Yeah, people were like, Ryan is too young to know that. No. What about Boston? I like Boston. Uh huh. Aerosmith, ACDC, all those bands. So I was all rock, and then I kind of just stayed all rock up until, oh, even into college, because I was in a rock band, and I liked like all the, what my friends in my college suite called cutting music. <laughs> <laughs> so th- that was the, they were like, oh, Ryan, you know, he likes all this weird music. And, uh, so, so like, like, is it like real emo music, like Dashboard Confessional, or not, you know, it was more like bordering on kind of what what we talked about, like a little bit of hardcore type screamo type uh-huh. stuff. Like, what about, I wasn't super into it. I just was like, oh, I like rock, you I, know, like whatever it is. I can't remember if I've asked you these questions or Gravy Lookout because y'all are doppelgangers. But Glassjaw, no, nope. no, I don't think okay. so. So I liked Finch. It, yeah. Okay. I listened to that. Um, I liked, but I liked also more like new metal type stuff, uh-huh, like uh-huh. Seether and yeah, yeah, that type of thing. So that was one of my favorite bands. So I was all into the who did who did sing Red again? Who was that? Chevelle. Chevelle. Yes. Yeah. That type of thing. Yeah. So I had the I, you know I dyed my hair black and I had like. <laughs> But at some point, I don't know how I naturally got into like the singer songwriter thing because that's like the music I was making. Uh I don't know how it happened. I think it was just because I was like, I have a guitar and I'm a solo person and sitting in my room. So I guess that's what it becomes. But that's what happened. And then I made a few kind of albums of acoustic music. And then I started listening to country like five years ago. Up until then, my parents were always like, oh, no, country is like, it's too twangy, it's too this. And if you take that away, kind of, though, I liked the songwriting aspect of it. Like, Uh the songs are very well written Uh because people do it as a profession. Right. So I just started paying more attention to that, and then I like country a lot now, actually. Um, You know, for those that are watching, I knew Mm -hmm. Ryan from the music before I knew he was a lawn care guy. And I'll never forget being so shocked that you were a lawn care guy. And I was like, no, that's the music guy. And <laughs> yeah. you had like 12,000 subscribers at the time. And I was like, oh my God, he's a huge lawn care guy. Yeah. Yeah. That just, it happened weirdly, like kind of, because I didn't have the background like you did. I didn't have a professional background in it. I was just like, an OCD type of guy who wanted a nice yard and it just turned into wanting to learn more about it, which I still am every single day. So because of your singer songwriter ability, Mm -hmm. um, does it send you down that wormhole with your music? Like who you listen to for influence? Yeah. And that's where I've kind of, I don't know how that whole thing started, but yeah, I started going down that whole more acoustic based, stuff Mm -hmm. and then that kind of led me to the the country thing just because again it's more it starts out usually as like some kind of acoustic song that somebody writes and then it eventually turns into that it turns into a rap song yep (laughs) (laughs) so it's it's interesting i don't know i'm not sure how i got there because it was i just think that i felt that even though i liked rock music all along i didn't really have the voice for it it was kind of you know, I didn't have like a gravelly voice or something. Not you know? enough whiskey in your throat? Yep. Whiskey and 
Paul Mall Reds. Yep. No, none of those. No. <laughs> no. That's, that's my history. <laughs> <laughs> so the one story too, did you hear me tell this about when I met you at GIE and we were talking about um, how old we were and I was like, oh, I think we're the same age. You're like, oh, I'm 32. I was like, yeah, I'm 32 as well. And then like later that night, my wife was like, hey, you kept telling Matt that you were 32 and you guys were the same age. You're 33, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> and I was like, I am? She's like, yes, you are. <laughs> don't so, lie to me, Ryan. I'm telling you, don't lie to me, Ryan. I know. Oh, uh, Let's take a couple more questions and then we're already at an hour and five minutes. Oh, wow. Wow, that went fast. Yeah. My goodness. I want to look through my list here and see if I had anything else I really wanted to ask you. Let me ask how, how many how much hate do you get in your comments? Um, you know, not like a ton, but it just depends on kind of the topic, I guess. But I I always have my down votes like instantly. Uh huh. As soon as I post a video, <laughs> it's like three or four people instantly thumbs down. What is what is what is your most common critique? Hmm. Well, I got one today, but it was from an old video and someone was like, oh, this is YouTube. We need you to get to the point. And I'm like, <laughs> so he said I was like talking about half the video of, or like showing things that weren't related to what I was talking about. And I went back and watched and it was like 30 seconds. Of B-roll? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> wow, this is like aggressive. But Those are those are my, my favorite ones to get because I, I get the same three things. One, your music sucks. Like, yeah, I know. I get it. <laughs> it's free. I'm, I'm, it's free, and I'm I'm weird. I I like to turn up EDM really loud and have an adult beverage, and my wife will dance around the room, and the kids all have a good time. It's mm -hmm. fine. I'm sorry. I do that. Number two is this guy loves to hear himself talk. I've gotten that comment on more videos. Yeah. Well, the basis of yours is a lot of you need to explain things which involves you talking for more than 30 seconds. Like to uh -huh. explain what you're talking about, it's going to have to be a little bit longer than that. Uh -huh. But in our day and age, you know, nobody has that attention span anymore. No, definitely not. And I don't know what I'm doing either, really. Like I have to watch your videos to try <laughs> and get inspiration on how to edit a video that's palatable <laughs> to watch. Um, and then the third one I always get is, Stop with the freaking intros. Yeah. Because I have really long. You had, well, that was for a little while where you were like, wasn't that maybe when you got your drone and you were kind of showing a lot of stuff yeah. like that? And yeah. Just kind of going, which I kind of liked because I got to see your, you know, where you lived and stuff like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, I've, I've since learned as well that it's very, even though to me, when you film something, you have all this footage it's very important to like cut it very quickly. Yes. And it makes you mad because you're like, Oh, I have to cut that out. I like that shot. But yes. Yes. You have to do it. So any other questions here for Mr. Matt before we go and uh, have a nice little evening? <laughs> I love, I love the comment by Ray. This is, this is why I love green dot. <laughs> Ignore the tree hugging lawn haters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was those um, one video that I put out about killing clover that was pretty much entirely about how I'm a terrible person. Who who's king of the hill vids? I don't know. I just <laughs> I just deleted them. So uh, that is funny. Uh, no, that's it. You go ahead. No, I don't. I don't think. No, uh, you go ahead. I don't think we really have anything else here. No, you go ahead. Anything? No, I'm fresh out, man. I'm all done. Okay. I'm over it. Well, this was a lot of fun. Again, Matt traveled all the way to be here. So thank you very much for doing that and for sitting down and chatting a little bit. We touched on some things that I wanted to touch on. Carbon X, you gave some more info there. And I wish you all the best with that. I hope to speak a little more to you about that and kind of how I might use it as oh, well. Oh, we're going to be talking about it. I've got ideas. Yep. I've got big ideas. So uh, for all of you watching live, thank you so much. Uh, if you did not catch us live, I'll hopefully have this up on audio maybe tomorrow if all goes well. So uh, let me... Ryan, get... 
Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate it. No problem. This is so much fun. It was fun. You know I love to do this. Yep. I love the attention. <laughs> I love to hear myself talk. I think you sounded pretty good. Hey, so. thanks. Hopefully I wasn't screaming at people too much. No, you were not. So thank you guys for watching. We will catch you on the next one. Take it easy.